Just first, before we start, we, um, our team operates out of the IT and the learning systems team. Uh, we're a school box school, obviously. Um, and those of us in the group, uh, Kate, who's uh, last year was employed as a literature and research teacher, uh, aka teacher librarian, also psychology teacher, and a head of house. Um, and Ed, who is our um, robotics VR guru. Um, and then just a shout out to Laura, who's here. Who's, she was here at 7 a.m. camped out. So <laughs> she just really wanted us to do a shout out to Laura. So, yeah. so uh, La Laura, myself, and Ed manage our school box instance. But we're here today to do something a bit different um, about VR and AR. Just firstly, the difference between virtual reality and augmented reality. Very easy to know the difference. One is um, if you can see 1% of the real world, it's augmented reality on the right there. You'd know it from Pokemon Go. Um, and here on the photo on the left is um, some of our students using our HTC Vive equipment. Um, we're going to be chopping and changing a fair bit during this presentation. So we're going to start with how we got into virtual reality in the first place, uh, how we got the funding for all the equipment, how it's connected to the curriculum and then what we're going to do next with it. Um, we're hoping to give you some really tangible, concrete things that you can take away from today and do and implement as of next week. Uh, nothing worse than coming to one of these things and then thinking, oh my God, what are we going to do? So I'm going to actually ha pass over to Kate, who's been using VR and AR in uh, humanities and psychology. Everyone hear me okay? Okay. Um, good morning. I'll do a bit of a full disclosure first. I'm pretty green when it comes to most of the VR and AR. This is my second year at St Michael's and prior to being here I was 18 years at Siena College, not doing any VR or AR at all. So I think if there's anyone in the room like me that this is accessible for everyone. This isn't a, a tech thing. This is a thing that any teacher can um, implement into the classroom. So I just wanted to put that right out there. Um, but there's also that school of thought that can come that can be dangerous, that it's some sort of novelty or it's something for a bit of fun or it's a bit of a gimmick. And in order for it not to be, we need to be really mindful about how we actually embed it into the curriculum. So part of my role, I, I am a psychology teacher, so I was very open to finding ways that we could actually integrate that into our key skills and knowledge um, in the curriculum itself across year 11 and year 12. But also as my literacy role, uh, supporting the other faculties, part of the role is to find ways to integrate the VR and AR into their curriculum. So the examples that we'll look at today involve the Year 7 Humanities curriculum and then also the Psych curriculum as well. So the first one we'll look at is Google Expeditions. Who here is familiar with Expeditions? Who's used it in the classroom before? Super. Okay, so some of you can share your stories with each other and we'll, I'll let you know about our journey as well. So Google Expeditions, in essence, again, if you're going to make it meaningful, the example that we'll use is Year 7 Humanities. We have an ancient China unit. Um, what we needed to make sure that we had to, again, use this within the classroom was the VR cardboard viewers. Ideally, if you have one per student within a classroom, that's excellent. If you've got one between two, you're still able to uh, go on quite the expedition, uh, just chopping and changing between two students. Uh, a smartphone for each student and the iPad or a smartphone for the teacher as well. So it's about being a little bit more prepared as well. You can run this without a literacy assistant, but um, making sure that the kids have, have downloaded things like the app prior to coming into the classroom because you want to have that meaningful experience without sitting there and fiddling um, download, downloading apps and doing all that sort of stuff uh, beforehand. Um, the example that I will show, and again, you can fiddle with this anytime you want on the app itself, um, looking for specifically ancient China and again, making it meaningful. We could have just found a tour of China and gone with that and said, you know, have at it kids, but part of the curriculum itself really does focus on you know physical features and then the development of the civilization so you can look at things like a sort of a geographical expedition of china and find out ways how that's actually influenced um, culture and civilization itself so being able to look as you can see here it's not um it's not as great without your cardboard on but you can actually view 
the globe itself and to start to see the topography and have discussions with the kids about, well, if this is a mountainous region, how has that dictated um, the civilizations that, uh, that we see today and how has that dictated the farming um, that's, that's done in China? Um, I have to fly through because we've got a lot. We haven't really timed this um, to perfection. But again, you can see student view and guide view. So for me, not having taught Year 7 Humanities in a little while, um, there's actually guided questions there. There's things that you can read out to the students that they don't see while they're looking through the cardboard. So for them, they're immersing themselves in whatever um, scene you're showing them. So here they're looking sort of an aerial view down onto things like uh, the rice fields and the farming land and you can actually ask them questions about what they can see, give them the, the guided readings and let them explore things that way. Um, that's just a quick flick through of the topography one I was telling you about but also you can still embed a little bit of, of fun in there as well. One of the slides in this particular expedition uh, looks at Hong Kong and if they've got the cardboard on and look down you get a real sense of vertigo looking down onto the buildings of Hong Kong um, modern day as well which is always fun. Um, now again that doesn't limit itself to things like geography if you look through the expeditions again there's a heap of ways it can be embedded across um, English curriculum as well across science um, psychology in particular you can look at the cerebral cortex um, the structure of the limbic system all of those things are available um, on Google expeditions and even, you know, highly specific things. So don't, don't discount if you're doing something a little bit obscure that you won't be able to find something that you could actually use quite meaningfully on, on expeditions. I'll be back a little bit later with some AR, I think. So that's at the, that's at the very cheap end of the scale. Um, when it got to the higher end, fully immersive virtual reality equipment, we needed several thousand dollars uh, of funding to get this gear. Um, after I went to ISTE in 2015, I went to the board with our team and said, it's the budgeting cycle is too restrictive to, um, to predict things up to 18 months in advance. So we asked them for a rolling um, R&D fund um, each year that we would have in the capital expenditure that we would still have to put a case for forward. Um, so this was actually our first um, application to that fund. Our previous IT manager applied for it with Ed um, on the basis of an action research project. Um, so the laptop itself that we uh, run it with is probably about a three and a half, four thousand dollar laptop. Um, the HTC Vive gear, as you can see, there's lots of cables, lots of adapters and bits and pieces and light boxes and everything. Um, that was about $1,100 or so. So there's a bit of a fair bit of money you need for that. And you also need um, someone like Ed or myself or a, a technical person just to help you with the actual setup each time. It takes about 15 minutes to set up and pack down. So Ed's actually come up with a better solution that we'll talk through as well. I'm going to hand over to Ed, who um, has led the charge at our school with the VR gear. At first, I was a bit sceptical about whether um, it would get implemented properly in the classroom. And to Ed's credit, he's done an outstanding job of finding connection with students, whether it be in visual arts, um, humanities, literature and research. So. I'm going to pass over to Ed, who's going to show you um, a lot of the work that they've achieved. Thanks, Dave. Um, great to be here, firstly. Yeah, so who's currently actually using Vive or kind of any high-end things in this? Cool. Yeah, so integrating VR into the classroom can actually be, a, you know, can be a really difficult and challenging task. Um, when I first got the Vive headset, I was like, oh, what do I do? But looking around, I'm like, how do we best do it? In the, how do we do it quickly and efficiently? So my main role at school is I actually work with students and teachers on a one-on-one -on -one basis, so I'm actually not a teacher. So I have the flexibility of being able to actually walk into a classroom and kind of see and kind of try and prove the way that we do things. So student leaders. So I've got Monique Lansdell here, which, who I've worked with probably the last three or four years, and her background is in kind of like um, sketching, iPad, stuff like that. So I thought to myself, you know what, let's just give students the first access to the VR gear. So I'm gonna show you a quick video of um, Monique's first artwork back in 2017.
Yeah, so that app is called uh, Google Tilt Brush, which is a free app which you guys can download. So it's a really great um, tool where you can actually um, where you can actually draw in and actually import different kind of files. So if you're working, you know, if you create like an SDL file or a 3D file, you can actually import that into Tilt Brush and then you can actually create um, your own world. Um, so talking about kind of Tilt Brush further is we decided um, that Tilt Brush was a great kind of starting platform to when we actually want to actually create and integrate it in the classroom. So Yeah, so our first attempt at um, trying to actually integrate um, VR into our curriculum was with our year one team. So let's go, shall we? They all climbed up the topmost branch to the great white cloud. The ladder led through the hole as usual to the land above. One by one they climbed it and stood in the strange country above the magic cloud. They were in the land of take what you want and topsy turf. There were rainbows on the ground. It was indeed strange. It was simply crowded with things and people. It was quite difficult to move about. Animals of all kinds wandered here and there like unicorns reading books. Stalls of the most wonderful. All right, um, yeah, I won't play the whole video because it goes for like five minutes and we don't have enough time. But um, anyway, so the best thing about Tilt Brush is that you can actually record and create GIFs and photos. So what Bronnie Horrocks did actually is I actually filmed the whole kind of presentation and then she took the video and put it into iMovie and then got students to actually talk about their virtual experience through the actual scene. So it kind of, because originally... Um, what they did is actually just create, like they just kind of drew, drew things on a piece of paper, but we thought, okay, how can we kind of take it to the next level and do something new and actually get them fully engaged um, within the curriculum? So before even going into VR, we actually got them to sketch out um, kind of how, how they want to actually create um, their, their virtual world because I found out early during the process is that you need to actually have a really strong structure when you're trying to actually create a VR curriculum. You need to actually be able to sit down with the students and actually map out what it looks like because there's no point of putting kids in virtual reality and just expecting them to actually create something kind of that's amazing. So this is our first early step. And then after actually creating um, the virtual world, we get them to actually reflect on how they found their experience. And during this process, we actually found that they actually were able to really engage. And like, I guarantee you, if these students were here now, they'd be able to tell you exactly what they created. So they actually were really, really keen and like kind of really were able to engage with the um, curriculum a lot better um, than previous years. Do I skip the slide? Oh, cool. Yeah, so um, this is our year two uh, for Mini Melbourne from uh, last... Oh, I can't access the video. It yes, doesn't matter. Um, yeah, so this is our last year. So this is our year twos, and um, it's, it's, it was uh, based around our tail unit um, called Mini Melbourne, where st students were actually required to uh, create um, their own kind of city and kind of structures around Melbourne. So, um, unfortunately, I can't show this video, but we actually used Google Blocks, which is like another free application um, where you guys can actually like, it's, we can actually create shapes and objects, um, which is a really, really cool app, which I'll be using um, later on um, for like year 10s and year 12s. Um, so, what we actually did, um, we actually got them to create, uh, it was um, MCG, so this on there, that kind of black. So that red oval, um, Eureka Sky Deck, um, and a couple of other um, buildings around Melbourne. Now, when we first did this, the teachers were like, okay, this is great, but what more kind of, how can we increase VR in our space? So I had to actually go away and kind of figure out what we wanted to do. So what I came back with them was research, documentation, and creation. So, um, for one day, they actually go to uh, Sky Deck and actually get to view Melbourne, but they actually wanted to see other kind of buildings around Melbourne. 
So I um, loaded up Google Earth VR, which is very similar um, to Google Maps, but you can actually kind of fly and kind of go from street view um, to uh, street view to kind of sky view or whatever. Yes, yeah, so this is actually um, in the atrium in our space. So you're probably wondering, how do you really get students engaged in VR? Because it can be very, it, it, it can be a very singular experience. So um, what we had the students do, we had them all kind of sitting um, in their chairs, so in the in the space, and, and the teachers actually kind of designed a framework where they would actually have questions, and students had to actually engage um, with kind of the, the experience. So. Some polls you can see. So all these were student responses. I'll just kind of skim through these. There's more, so the MCG. And the best thing is you can actually save locations. So um, before class, I actually went through and saved all the different locations because trying to set this up whilst you go, it can take a bit of time. But I think if, if you have someone at your school who can do this, then it will save um, a lot of time. Yeah, now Tool Creator. Um, Tool Creator is like Google Cardboards. Um, it's another free app through Google. Um, this is where you can actually create um, your own kind of virtual tours. So um, a couple of years ago, we invested in a 360 camera called a Rico. Um, and we actually, well, I did, is I actually um, went around and documented the uh, learning process. So you'll see here, I've got a couple of, so the bottom photos are actually the 360 photos and the top ones are um, just still just, just normal photos there. So I actually went through the classes and actually documented um, each learning process. So you've got the research stage, and then we've got them actually at Eureka Sky Deck, um, those two photos there. Now, when you're actually creating it in Tool Create, you can actually add like tabs and icons and stuff like that. So you'll see here in the bottom photo is that I've actually, I've actually pinned photos to individual students um, so when their parents are looking through the photos, then they actually spot their kid. Um, and also you can add information there, which is really, really handy. And just recently, you can also embed videos, which could be really cool um, going forward. Yeah, so back to my first slide. So Google Blocks, um, what I'll do is I'll quickly go through kind of the stages that we used it. So you see the top left there, um, that's kind of was during the research stage where we kind of sat them all down in small groups of three. So, th so this is one year group. So for the year two, there's about 30 students. Um, so I actually went down there over, I reckon, probably three or four weeks or so doing this. And we actually got them in the small groups to actually recreate um, the, their, their scene, so which, is, which is pretty cool. Cool, so showcasing the work. Um, so on the day, we actually invited all the uh, parents to come in, the, the year two parents to come in and actually experience um, Mini Melbourne. So you'll see the top left there, we've got them like with all the cardboard and then we've got the VR set up. And now you can actually also embed your VR content. So I actually exported it from um, Google Blocks and uploaded it onto Google Poly, which is a free, um, free site. And I actually got Laura to embed it for me using, was it whitelisting, I think? It is, it is now. Um, yeah, so yeah, so there's a lot, of, um, a lot of cool things that you can do. Are there any kind of questions before I keep going or we're pretty good in time being, cool. All right, so um, visual arts. So, so VR, so visual arts have been really, have been really been pushing kind of the use of VR um, in their, their space. So there's just a couple of photos um, that I pulled off that we've been using it for. So I'm just going to go through a couple of quick ones. So we've got Year 8 Still Life, um, which was created last, oh, so yeah, last year, sorry, last year. Yep, yep. Oh, there you go. <laughs> okay, I want to show you that then. Okay, it's been blocked. Um, yeah, so that was a um, Still Life is where they made like a, a bowl with um, kind of apple and stuff in it. And that was done over three or four weeks. So um, we've actually, I'm lucky enough to have a space um, in, in my, where, where I work, um, where I can actually bring students in for, could be you know, one period, and they can actually work through um, their, their project. The bottom one is character, character designs, similar to the top one. Um, 
where two students come in and actually work on their piece of work um, for three or four weeks, depending on how they go. Now I'll pass over to Kate. Um, I think what Ed was saying before, emphasising that it really is a, a team effort. So he'll often find interesting things and we'll have a chat about, well, how could we actually use that in a classroom and would it be worthwhile? So when he came to me last year with um, Richie's plank experience, um, which essentially is VR walking a plank off a building, and you'd think to yourself, mm, I'm not sure that how that's going to work. It sounds like a bit of fun, but maybe not um, curriculum-based. But in actual fact, when I went away and thought about it for a little while, I realised how we could embed it into the psychology curriculum on a number of levels. But in this instance, we thought, well, anyone walking VR on a plank off a 100-storey building is probably going to find themselves physiologically aroused. So we're looking at you know, increased heart rate, sweaty palms, all that kind of thing. So we thought, well... We know that's actually part of the course for the students. They need to understand the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. So why don't we also try and structure an experiment to see who is actually going to be more physiologically aroused? Is it our male or our female students? So it gave them an opportunity not just to structure an experiment, but it also gave them an opportunity to measure their physiological responses. So I think the next one um, is a video. Please let it be a video that's working. Yep. So all I've got there, and again, we can come back to this later, is really systematically how I embedded that into the curriculum. So for psych, there are specific in unit one or unit three, like you could actually use this um, component of VR and model, model a SAC on it. If you're going to do an experiment, um, that could be your SAC write-up. For unit one, it was looking at the central and peripheral nervous system. So again, that physiological arousal of the heart rate, and we measured the heart rate of each kid on, a, on an app pre and post walking this plank. Okay, and that was our research hypothesis and I've already mentioned that. So that's a couple of photos. So Ed's other idea, and again, I hadn't thought about this, was if you wanna make it as real as possible, they actually should feel like they're stepping up onto an actual plank. So even though it is quite immersive when they've got the headset on, that physical feeling, and I did it myself too, and it was very frightening, um, of stepping up onto the plank really does sell that experience for them. So there's a couple of still photos of the kids doing that, but we've also got a video of, um, I think it's Marina taking things very, very seriously in this next one. Oh, and that's, sorry. Sorry, it's yeah, coming. No, I'm being good. I'm like creating suspense. Um, <laughs> here as well, and again, I don't expect anyone to read that, but again making sure that it's documented as an experiment so you can have fun we don't want to squash them from having fun but really bringing it back to the curriculum so they were able to tally things on onto those documents um, we also took it as an opportunity we just rolled out using one note and a classroom notebook so the kids were also doing tallies in the collaborative space on the OneNote app, which allowed us to use that, um, that technology as well so we're just kicking goals all over the place with this unit and here is yet yeah, marina the setup of the space we use is the atrium. We've got a video wall where the audience can see what the person in virtual reality is seeing. Um, and that's the way we get the whole class engaged in the content. And you see the light boxes there. So you need the, there's a fair bit of wiring to set up before a session. Don't tell them to jump, but she did jump. Um, also, I was tending to her, but also grabbing her thumb so we could do her heart rate and get the data because that part was vital. Um, she's fine. She had some carpet burn. So we also then used VR for keep talking and nobody explodes. So again, it sounds initially just a bit of a fun gimmick, but it worked incredibly well, again, within the psychology curriculum. So we're talking here about one person looking at a, a bomb essentially so we have hannah here and i'll show you a video in a second and she sees the surface of the the bomb when she's got the headset on her instructions have to come from between one and three people who all have the bomb diffusal kit in front of them and you can see the students here reading from this kit so they will say things to her like okay well how many how many red wires can you see because they, they're not allowed to see 
the bomb itself. So it becomes imperative that they're communicating very clearly. So again, we have an audience in the atrium watching. We have the three bomb diffusers with all the information in front of them who cannot see what it is that Hannah's seeing. And it's up to them to communicate effectively. So maybe Hannah describes what she can see or maybe it's them asking questions. So the way we linked that into the curriculum was to look at social influences on behaviour. So we linked it back into that social psychology about, well, how do we collaborate in groups? How are we cooperative? Do we have someone that takes over and, um, you know, sort of runs the show versus... Um, you know, linking it back to power dynamics in Zimbardo's experiment. So there's a whole wealth of ways you can link it back into the curriculum. Um, but also it's fun and it's stressful. And I think we do have a, yep, footage there. Thank you, Dave. And by the way, Kate and I dominate at actually this Killed hour. Killed it. The, the kids struggle. We, we did not explode. <laughs> and you'll notice um, because the countdown is there, you will detonate if you don't solve it in five minutes. So it actually becomes very stressful. That sound is them blowing up because I think in that instance, poor old Harry, he hadn't um, read the instructions properly. But again, they learnt from that. So it, you can still have the actual class participating because I use them as the data collectors. So you had the people reading out the experiment, but then you also had in the audience on the in the atrium, what observations did we see? So when instructed to do something, did Hannah obey? So we linked it into the obedience component of the curriculum as well. So obedience, um, conformity and power. So all three dynamics we use the data to collect from and then um, turn that into an experiment and a write-up later on. So everyone in the class actually had a chance to participate as opposed to sort of sitting there and, and watching. So they were all active data collectors. Um, that's the documentation for that. Again, I'm happy to um, talk to people about that later. And then the, o the only other one, um, if you wanted to, again, use this in the curriculum, and I'm saying specifically for psych, but we also thought within a homeroom or a, like a, a positive learning session, you could do this as a team building exercise um, as well. The bomb diffusal could be used for that. But also there's an AR version on a merge cube. So again, using an app, are you gonna talk about these? Yeah. Like, yeah using one of these, it becomes a bomb itself and you can individually be the person to um, diffuse that bomb. So it becomes a one-on-one -on -one game. So you can do it as, as a single player, but again, asking them to record their own observations. How did you feel physiologically? Did you feel stressed when you realised that the time was going down? There's a heap of leads um, to link that into psych, into any sort of team building or, or, or positive curriculum as well. Um, yeah, so some of the other VR projects that I've worked with students um, hasn't actually been in the classroom. So um, first I'll talk about speech night. So last year um, we were down at Hamer Hall for our annual speech night and this year the school decided that we wanted to incorporate VR um, into it. So um, before the show actually started we actually got Monique Warwick, uh, sorry Monique Lanzel and Tristan Bust. Now Tristan obviously is on the cello. So with Tilt Brush you can actually incorporate music into your artwork. So you'll see there that we had the music, so we had the microphone um, obviously over his cello, and then actually integrates really nicely with um, the kind of the artwork. So Monique was actually doing it live. Now another really, um, really popular um, app with our senior school students is called King Spray, um, which is like a virtual reality spraying tool. We can actually create um, kind of virtual artwork. So um, Jan will actually be using it for this year for his year 12 artwork, so he's gonna use it actually as like more of the um, design concept, which would be kind of pretty cool going forward. What's next? Here you go, here you go. Cool. Yeah, so we've got some pretty cool things coming up um, for VR at our school. So I've just finished working on our VR space, just finished yesterday. So we actually received funding from the PCA, which is our parent um, kind of group. And we were given, well, we were given money to actually build our own kind of VR space because 
we found that having a portable VR space, is, uh, having a portable VR set is great, but having a dedicated space where you can actually do VR is really important going forward, I think. Um, so Vive has just released um, this new part where you can actually use Vive wisely. So some of you who might have Vive have, have got a headset, a sort of tethered headset, um, but you can see there, Monique's actually got the new wireless option. So we're actually able to cut the tether now. So kitchen, cool. Um, so kids can actually now walk through the space without having a tether or needing someone else in the space to help them. So um, going forward, we'll be able to um, actually have two VR sessions. So we might have a one year eight student up in my lab and one VR student in this lab doing the uh, virtual, virtual space. Oh yeah, I would mentioned, yeah. So um, instead of me building it, I decided to actually give students a project and say, all right guys, I'm gonna give you $5,000 and go and build a computer for me. So working closely with the IT team, they actually built this from scratch. And I think the best way to learn sometimes is just give them the tools and, they'll, and then they'll build it. It might not be correct all the time, but I think giving kids ownership of a project, especially um, when it comes to technology, they'll really, like going forward, I think they're gonna actually respect the space a lot more. So they were, they were year eight, um, these are year eight boys who then worked with the IT help desk staff to specify the PC, order all the parts, get it in and build it together. And you can see they've just decked it out with LEDs, even through the fans, the RAM, the cooling systems, it's ridiculous. Um, and the other thing about, the really good thing about this space is that was actually a meeting room beforehand that we thought wasn't getting used enough. So we just commandeered the space. We put a lock on the outside of the door. We've still made it a meeting space if anyone from executive asks, but we've got the light towers in the corner there. You can see Monique's got no wires on her. Um, the TV on the wall was already there. So we chose a room that was already, had some of the infrastructure um, and just um, switched it about. Ed's gonna, tell me this one. Yeah, last one. Yes, yeah, so last year I was working on kind of VR sculpting and actually trying to take it out because like it's great creating things in VR, but then trying to have a physical object, I think is the next step. So I actually um, started playing around with VR sculpting. So hopefully um, this year I'm gonna start doing with the uh, DT uh, Year 12 students when they're actually designing um, you know, their tables or their projects that they're working on uh, this year. So some rapid prototyping from the, from the VR experience. I can see the object from multiple spaces rather than on a flat screen. This is a project we've been doing with year six art students last year. Um, so you can see there, the students were doing pottery and normally what would get shared with the parents is some flat photos of the pottery. The students would take the pottery home and would never see the pottery ever again. So we came up with the concept, um, lending on Alan November's idea of getting students to publish their work rather than submit their work. We said to them, well, um, to submit your work onto Schoolbox, you need to actually 3D scan your pottery and upload the object file. We then take the object file. Uh, so scanning that is a, an app called Clone with a Q, Q-L-O-N-E. Um, so we've got an iPad there in an iGrapher case on a tripod. Then Laura brought in her lazy Susan from home. The QR sort of mat there um, is, <laughs> the QR mat there is like the calibrator. Um, and Rather than moving the iPad around the object, they'd actually just spin the Lazy Susan and it captures the pottery. Then, uh, with one of these merge cubes, which Laura also ordered from America for us, because uh, you can't get them in Australia, uh, we upload the object file, which in contains the STL and the texture, into Miniverse. Miniverse then gives you a code, which you then open in um, Object Viewer. This is all on iOS, so our students in Year 6 have got iPads, so they can do all of this from their own device. And then what happens is um, this cube, the still frame already gives it away, but you can see this is my desk, there's a shameless plug for a school box, and the cube turns into the pottery. So you can then keep the pottery forever in a virtual gallery if you wanted people to come and see the work from years gone past. Um, challenge to the librarians of how you store an object file in a catalogue. Good luck to you on that one. Um, and then we're also looking at um, merge cubes with CoSpaces EDU. So CoSpaces EDU is a 3D platform 
drag and drop, works on iOS, Android, uh, web browser based. Um, and you can then, um, you can bring in a house design, you can put the cardboard viewer on, you can then launch that in a cardboard viewer, you can see, you can be, like, be inside your own house design. Um, or you could actually put objects on the merge cube. So Ed's working with, was it year nine with To Kill a Mockingbird? That's a work in progress. Um, Ed's, no, Ed's, Ed's amazing actually using co-spaces. I'm still learning to get objects onto each side of the cube. But we thought a really good way, instead of the standard book review, um, tell us who your favourite character was, blah, blah, would be to use the merge cube through co-spaces. And each side of the cube will have either a different scene summary or a different character. So one way we were looking at it was one side was Scout and you could put text in it and you could hold the merge cube there and say, oh, here's Scout, here's an image that speaks to Scout, here's something about um, her journey through the novel and then flip it and then Atticus would be on the next side. You could do it that way or go scene by scene and have you know one side of the merge cube is about setting, scroll to the next scene, the next side of the merge cube was about um, race, race relations um, throughout the book. So different ways to engage kids in a novel as opposed to just a standard, um, a standard book report. So we're, we're hoping to trial that, aren't we? Aren't we? Yeah. We're, we're going to launch that in term two with an with a English class. Um, and you can see there you've got Blockly coding on the actual object, so you could use this in the digital technologies curriculum as well. If you want to see more about um, merge cubes with AR, uh, shameless plug, Ed and I are doing a roundtable at Future Schools in March, if you want to come along to that to have a hands-on session with one of these. Now, we have uh, five minutes for questions. You know, we have any questions about the software, the hardware? Kate will answer those ones. <laughs> Anything about the curriculum, I will answer. Just so you know, Stu has a microphone. So if anybody does have a question, you guys can just uh, pop up and up. Yep. I think that I found that there was a danger in that with the humanities, um, doing it with the ancient China, um, with Year Sevens especially. At, at one point, it felt a little like herding cats. And we had a couple of options. One was if you have the staff there, you can break them off into small groups. Um, that's not always something that we're able to do. The other thing that I found worked quite well is actually pausing the scene. So it would actually black out their view. So blacking out their view, and I would say, I'm just going to, you know, just the, the power of the wait, I'm just going to wait till we're all ready, release the scene again, and then you can actually monitor them because you see them not by name, but the dots come in, so you can see that they're hovering over the same point of that scene as you are. So that actually, that helped, because I was able to say things to them like, I can't see all your dots yet, and I'd pause it again and then wait till they all came back. And another thing is just, just incentive, like, I, you know, we're looking at this scene now, but in a minute we might be able to, um, you know, go for a run through Hong Kong and that kind of thing. But, but you're absolutely right. It's that it can be, yeah, time consuming, but if you've got your little tactics down, it's usually okay. Just... Yeah, I think so, because um, I still want to have the flexibility of being able to take VR into the classroom. I think it's great having a space, but when you're kind of doing it for introduction stage, you want to be able to have kids around it and explaining it to them, because if it's in the space, obviously they can't really move things around. But yeah, I think it's still important to have that flexible VR option going forward. So 
Yeah. Just while you're there, Ed, yep. my question for you. Yes. Uh, are you, like, if a teacher wants to use VR with their class, do they book you in and then you bring the gear to them? Well, yeah, like now we can actually, uh, yeah, like they can come to me or I can go to them depending on what they're trying to achieve. So, it, yeah, so we've got both options now going forward. And um, have you got other roles other than VR or are you available pretty much the whole time to help out? Yeah, so I do like all sorts of things like Skull, VR, um, Office 365, a whole bunch of kind yeah. of different things. So yeah, it's, it's, like, it's like VR is one small part of my role here. Yeah. Ed, just a question on uh, Vive Port. Yep. Have you explored the various apps on there? Yeah, so you can actually get, there's so many apps, um, but you can also get a, a bunch, there's a, um, a um, subscription-based option where you can actually get a whole bunch of VR apps. Um, I think, Lord, how many apps do you get? <laughs> you're, the, you're the VR. Uh... <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to say we get, you can get five apps per month, um, but I haven't, yeah, like I just read about them and then just kind of, yeah, try them out. Yeah, just, it, there's heaps out there. We buy the software under the library's, um, what's that, audio-visual budget. 